This week on ACT OUT, why Indigenous Peoples Day matters, decolonizing the mind, the power of language, ideas, and shifting paradigms. Next up, there's an epidemic in this country of horrendous proportions, and yet you probably have not heard about it. We talk about the recently introduced Savannah's Act and raising awareness for stolen sisters. Finally, Mohawk filmmaker Paulette Moore heads back to Standing Rock and joins us to talk indigenous movements, healing, strategizing, and the eagle and the condor. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out. Welcome to ACT OUT. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. Just last week, Austin became the latest place to announce that they would no longer recognize Columbus Day. They will instead celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. A few days earlier, Salt Lake City made the same call. In late August, Los Angeles City Council voted to strike Columbus Day from the city calendar and replace it with Indigenous Peoples Day. Back in 1992, Berkeley was the first city to make such an announcement 14 years after the idea was first brought up by a delegation of Native Nations at the 1977 International Conference on Discrimination Against Indigenous Populations in the Americas. Since then, some 60 locations, including institutions, cities, counties, and even states, have traded Columbus Day for Indigenous Peoples Day. Now, some of you might be thinking... Who cares? This changes nothing. They still have no rights, big whoop, etc., etc. So, yeah, with the rene renaming of a day, millions of people aren't immediately recognized and given fundamental rights. However, let's consider a mental exercise for a second. Let's just say that fascists ruled our country. Crazy, right? But let's also say that they instituted a Hitler Day, a day to commemorate this fearless leader, eloquent speaker, and powerful visionary. That'd be so fucked, right? Now let's instead say that we had a Holocaust Remembrance Day, where we not only recognize the lives lost, but the lives still being lived, the survivors, the culture that has not disappeared despite the best efforts of many a fascist. Does the difference in name immediately mean that we no longer have fascists? Of course not. But the difference in name shapes our understanding. Here's another example. Winona LaDuke, the woman pictured addressing the UN and a longtime indigenous rights activist, has spoken extensively on what she calls the language of empire. In a 2010 lecture, she talked about what she called the naming of large mountains after small men and how this affects how we think about those mountains. Consider her example of Mount McKay, a mountain in Ontario, Canada, that was named after a Scottish dude in the mid-1800s. This mountain is actually a sacred place for Leduc's Ojibwe people and is known to them as Thunder Mountain. So think about that difference. How do you consider a Mount McKay versus a Thunder Mountain? Which name suggests respect for a place of immortal beauty, of power? Which place suggests a value system based on nature rather than mortal men? And that's precisely the point. The language of empire dictates how we think, how we feel. It tells us what our society values and thereby what we as citizens should value. Columbus Day celebrates and values genocide. It celebrates a violent colonialism that continues to this day. As Casey Camp Hornick from the Ponca Nation put in our COP21 broadcast from late 2015, the first onset of settlers came with bayonets, rifles, with smallpox blankets. But now they come with refineries, with fracking, with pipelines, and they kill the air, they kill the earth, and they kill the water, and that kills my people. Keeping Columbus Day on the books glorifies that history and the present. It tells kids in schools that they should be proud of the white, Eurocentric version of history and to give thanks if they're one of those savages who made it out alive, to be bettered by the invading hordes. It loudly says that our way of rape, torture, murder, and subjugation is better and always wins. It glorifies a past that forced Native children into brutal boarding schools in an attempt to amputate their heritage, their culture. Because when you separate people from their culture, the culture dies. For what is culture without people? 
Indigenous Peoples Day is about that culture. It's about recognizing and lifting up a history that isn't whitewashed and sanitized by empire. It's about celebrating the culture that survived, the people that survived, and using the name of a day, the words, to highlight what always existed, but that history's victors did their damnedest to destroy. As Michael Rios from Tulalip News wrote in regards to Seattle's Indigenous Peoples Day celebration, celebration and recognition of a day that not only provides us with a platform to raise awareness, but it also commemorates a history of survival and perseverance. Those of us who grew up with Columbus Day probably had to dig our way to recognizing some of the many indigenous cultures that aren't either ridiculed or relegated to a lifeless past. And that work of discovery continues. For those coming up now, this may be one less layer of white supremacist, colonial, patriarchal bullshit that they have to strip away from the realities of a capitalist empire in decline. We should never discount the power of language and the power of raising awareness through language. Indeed, if the powers that be can shape our understanding of terror based on religion, our consideration of thug based on color, our acceptance of sexuality based on gender, intellect based on class, and on and on and on, then why can't we, why shouldn't we, move to shift paradigms to change hearts and minds through the very same means? And while Indigenous Peoples Day was recognized around Turtle Island this past Monday, the fight for Indigenous rights continues. Last Thursday, October 5th, following pressure from her constituents, North Dakota Senator Heidi Haitkamp introduced Savannah's Act, named after Savannah LaFontaine Greywind, a member of the Spirit Lake tribe, who disappeared this past August in Fargo while eight months pregnant. Her body was found eight days later in the Red River. As posted on Hate Camp's Facebook page, Savannah's act aims to improve cooperation among law enforcement agencies at all levels so they can spring into coordinated action as soon as cases arise and help stop this epidemic to keep all of North Dakota's communities strong and safe. The epidemic that Hate Camp is referring to is 84% of Native women having experienced violence in their lifetime, 56% having experienced sexual violence. Native women are murdered at 10 times the national average. According to federal data, Native women are twice as likely to be sexually assaulted as women of other races. There's also an epidemic of Native women in sex trafficking. Nikki Crow, resident of the Fond du Lac Reservation in Minnesota, told The Guardian in an article on the subject last year, we've already been violated in so many ways, from historical trauma to the addiction to the sexual abuse that we don't talk about as communities, to the things that have happened at the boarding schools and the breakdown of our communities and our families. We're already so vulnerable that perpetrators see that we're so easy to victimize. Add to this the influx of thousands of predominantly white male workers into deserted areas of the Midwest for work on oil projects, and the stage is so well set for trafficking and sexual exploitation. Furthermore, authorities tend to not take Native cases seriously. On several occasions, Native women seeking help from local authorities have instead been jailed for bogus charges like smelling of alcohol. And due to the lack of statistics on Native women, those who are abducted for the sake of trafficking just fall into an abyss of unknown numbers of the disappeared and murdered. Savannah's act would be a preliminary motion to both raise awareness of this epidemic and gather information so as to know how to best confront it. Savannah's act would improve tribal access to federal crime information databases and mandate that the attorney general consult with tribes on how to further improve these databases and their access to them. It would also create standardized protocols for responding to cases of missing and murdered Native Americans, which will include guidance on interjurisdictional cooperation among tribal, federal, state, and local law enforcement. And finally, it would require an annual report to Congress on the statistics on missing and murdered Native women and recommendations on how to improve data collection. Allison Renville, member of and advocate for the Great Sioux Nation, worked directly on the introduction of this bill and told me over the phone last week, this is the first step in restoring integrity of the first women of this nation giving a more accurate portrayal of the situation on reservations and in tribal communities. A lot of things could come out of this. 
It is going to take a lot of work. This is a conversation that people need to get comfortable having. Allison pointed out that Native women have historical trauma that is triggered every day, that Natives have been conditioned to oppress themselves much in the same way that James Baldwin spoke on how black people have been taught to hate themselves. So as the work of decolonizing minds and bodies continues, Savannah's act represents a step, much like Indigenous Peoples Day, in recognizing the rights and realities of Indigenous people across the now so-called United States. Moving on, on with our indigenous coverage, you may recall from episode 102, Mohawk filmmaker Paulette Moore went to Standing Rock and documented camp life through her unique perspective, blending native traditions with modern media and tactics. Well, late last month, she was back at Standing Rock for the Mini Wachoni Healing Gathering, a series of days focused on healing, ceremony, reflection, strategizing, planning, and celebration, attended by water protectors, allies, and supporters. Paulette covered the event and joined us afterwards to talk about her experience there, future plans for Indigenous movements, and her own documentary work. Take a look. So, uh, so back in episode 102, we talked to you about your experience out at Standing Rock uh, and your short documentary, Spirit of Standing Rock. Uh, and now you've just been back to Standing Rock at the Mini Wachoni Healing Gathering. Talk about that event and your experience. That was a really important event for the water protectors to come back together. Um, as you know, Ocheti uh, and the other camps were evicted in February of 2017. So we didn't have access to those sites, like on the Cannonball River. Um, but this was a gathering on a private site on um, Standing Rock Sioux land, but on private property, um, on this woman's land named Phyllis Young, who opposed the pipeline back in 2014, she was already opposing the pipeline. Um, so really important for us to regather and see where we are a year later, all that energy that went into that movement. I think people are just like, Oh, we've moved on. It's been evicted. The water, the oil is flowing. Um, but coming together at that gathering was really important because, it was the core people who are still in relationship with the story and with the land and with the people, the, uh, the Lakota people and with and the Sioux people and with each other. And we were there in a place where the DAPA lights weren't shining on us and there weren't a bunch of, probably a few infiltrators, but <laughs> not as many as were there in the camps. Um, and really coming back to it, it's like, what is the core of this movement? What are the core beliefs? What are the core ceremonies? And people really did walk away with a lot of trauma from those events, a lot of beautiful connections and stories, but also a lot of just full on PTSD from those planes flying over constantly, being surveilled, um, being called terrorists. Um, it makes me emotional. Ah. Uh, to talk about it because, you know, the intention and the narrative of the people who were there um, and the practice of the people who were there was so different from what we saw, especially with Tiger Swan kind of at at the center of that, these private mercenaries shaping the narrative that was coming out of Standing Rock. So a lot of important things went on. So many layers of healing actually did happen. It's so amazing to have um, like, oh, we're going to have a healing event and actually it was. It was healing. It's great. That's fantastic. So would you, so with that, the the energy on the ground. You, I mean, you mentioned the the dapple lights. Uh, what is the what is the energy and what is the feeling on the ground right now? Now that uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline is is done. Well, there's a lot of fights that are still being fought. So on the on the um, side of di um, divestment. Uh, amazing divestment efforts still ongoing. Um, and then there are still legal battles to be fought. Um, the federal judge that's been involved in this, Boasberg, who is in Washington, um, a federal judge has decided that the Trump administration going ahead, bombing through with the permission for the pipeline was inappropriate. So we're in the middle of that legal battle right now. And he, he said there was, you know, the permitting pro process was inappropriate. Um, the um, Army Corps was in the midst of a public commenting process 
in in February, and then the administration just shut that down. You know, so they had started to take comments from people and a lot of really important, methodical, heartfelt commenting period, and that all just got shut down and sent away. So the oil is flowing, and I think what what is coming out in the next couple of months um, is the the tribes and Earth Earth Justice, who's at the core. They're bringing the lawsuits. Um, they need to make a case for why the oil should stop flowing while they figure out this process. So there's a lot that is still moving forward. And then, you know, that fire started, sparked, you know, there've been embers and embers and embers. The, the Sioux nations, it gives me goosebumps to talk about the Sioux nations because they're so classic in the minds of Americans and, you know, Canadian, like they are the people with the war bonnets and the people with the teepees. Um, and they've been cartoonized and in Hollywood and um, have been such fierce articulators and, and um, defenders of their lands for so, for so long, you know, it's like sitting bull and, you know, all these uh, historic figures that have fought back against, the U.S. government and those, that's the war that was still being fought out there. And those embers had been sitting there and then boom, that sparked such an amazing worldwide movement. So in also coming back, it was amazing to see how those fires have, have spread to other communities and how indigenous people remain at the forefront of the environmental movement. And for me, it really, uh, is tied to ceremony and it's to, and ceremony isn't sort of an ethereal hippy dippy way of being in life there. Those ceremonies are about connecting with each other. And when you think about in our, in our over culture that tells us like, if you're not busy, I mean, you ask anybody, how are you? Oh, so busy. Oh my God. So busy. And we don't allow, it's not validated to have time to honor each other and honor the earth and remind our, ourselves that the water is there and where we get our food, right? So this, the movie that I'm working on right now um, looks farther into ceremony as, um, as this way of, of connection. And because lots of people know things are broken, right? Almost everybody does. And we talk about ceremony as this untouchable, unknowable way of indigenous being or shamanic, you know, uh, we can do that. You can't. And, and it's not, that's not, it, you know, it's like the reason that exists is because it's very scientific. Actually, it's a scientific, scientific methodology that if I give thanks for the bugs every day, as we do in Mo Mohawk culture, or every single thing, the birds, the bugs, the grasses, one by one by one, all the way up whoop, to the sky world. It's, it's a methodology that reminds us, like if I say thanks to the bugs and then they're gone, then, then I'm like, oh my gosh, there's something wrong. So it keeps us in balance. And particularly since we are, you know, in, in this sort of, uh, in, the, in the US, particularly wired to just take and and get more and grab and not really consider a an ecosystem type of mentality. It's a top down mm -hmm. mentality. Um, with that, and I want to I want to come back to the to the film that you're working on, but I also want to talk about the you know you mentioned the the indigenous peoples being on the forefront of the environmental movement. Were th was there like talk about um, it, it, indigenous plans for the future, like more collaboration? I know that you know on the show we've covered uh, you know indigenous youth that were working the Stop Line Three project, and yep. uh, you know like Sharif Foytland down in Louisiana with uh, the, the against the Bayou Bridge. So yep. what, in your mind, uh, what you, from what you've seen and experienced, what is the future of this indigenous uh, resistance after the coming together at Standing Rock? Well, I think it, at, it's about remaining together. It's about the unity and relationships that were developed. And so there were a lot of people from Line 3 that were coming in and going out and the Bayou people coming in. And we were honoring um, what they're dealing with in Hawaii with the permissions for this huge telescope and, and sending energy out to people and literally kind of feeding the people that were coming from line three that needed 
uh, so a boost. And so these networks are so <laughs> massive and beautiful. So talk about the the new film that you're working on now, the the Eagle and the Condor. It's a it's a full length documentary, if I understand. Uh, what is the what is the 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 concept behind it? There are two films actually. One premieres on Indigenous Peoples Day, and that's the short version of Eagle and Condor. And then I'm working on this longer documentary that will come out in the spring. And on Indigenous Peoples Day one year ago. Um, a group of people came together. There's this prophecy about that's about the eagle and the condor, and those two birds, the highest flying birds, representing the north, the people of the north, and the people of the south. And so it started as a, an Inca an Inca ceremony um, prophecy, where it, when the people in the, of the north and the south come together and sort of swirl together, that's going to be a major event in our world's history and to watch for that for what watch for the and it's what we've just been talking about you know these people that come together and kind of swirl together and so my friend whose house i'm in right now um rebecca kemble is an alder person in madison wisconsin an amazing ally of the ojibwe here in wisconsin and and across the world really so she went out this time last year to deliver uh, a statement of support from the Madison City Council to Standing Rock Sioux Nation and the people who were at the water protector actions. And she was just going to be there for 24 hours and showed up at this ceremony of the Eagle and the Condor as a legal observer. So all of these people coming together and what happened on that one day, on Indigenous Peoples Day 2016, um, Rebecca and Grandmother Teresa Black Owl got arrested. They were strip searched. They were they had to bend over and cough and were left in jail overnight. Um, and then our Aztec friends came and they have these feathers. Sometimes these feathers are like five feet, six feet long, Young, a young group came, they danced, and that was about ceremony, right? So looking at that day as kind of a centerpiece for what went on at Standing Rock and understanding as well that uh, Tiger Swan, the private mercenary company, uh, was sending out information to uh, de sheriff's departments all over the Midwest and other agencies. Um, so they were literally in many ways calling the shots, shaping that narrative, calling uh, water protectors jihadists. Uh, so looking at that day, but also interviewing Will Parrish from The Intercept, who broke that story of leaked Tiger Swan emails, really showing their role in surveillance and, and their methodologies and how outrageous that was, but also just talking to each person that was there and their intention. Um, we also talked to reporter Jenny Monet, who's a really amazing indigenous reporter um, who got arrested uh, during the eviction of Last Child's Camp. And our friend BJ Nastasio, who disarmed a DAPL infiltrator and um, the guy with the AR-15 had no charges, Kyle Thompson, no charges levied against him. Our friend BJ, unarmed, stood like this for, you know, in the water with a guy who was threatening to shoot a bunch of Indians that day. That's what he kept saying. Um, charged at the state and federal level with felonies for terrorizing. So those are the things, just this like juxtaposition between what people were told was going on and then people's real intentions, the people who were there and really getting these narratives all these months later of what were people's intentions? Let's revisit that. You know, let's stay in relationship with the story and Indigenous Peoples Day 2016 as the organizing kind of concept of the peep of the police on that day coming in, arresting people in very brutal ways. So finally, um, 
considering uh, Indigenous Peoples Day and also considering, uh, you know, your own background, what are your what are your thoughts and feelings on Indigenous Peoples Day, and what would you hope that that non Native people would do, and also like w- would take away from that day? I think that non Native people really need to acknowledge the history of repression because the non Native people are so compelled. And so used to showing up and treating people as though they show up with the answers without really understanding context or how sophisticated our systems have been for centuries and how indigenous people are leading, you know, are leading these. And because we have the ceremony and because we understand relationship and because we understand this reciprocity, Um, A lot of work needs to be done. And when I um, spend time with any nation, it's just like even when I go out to Sioux territory, I'm listening to the Sioux, you know, and when I go and I'm with the Aztecs as they're dancing, they're the ones that are teaching me and I'm listening to them. So I think that understanding that there's so much education and that this relationship that non-native people have with native people as, as less than, or as that victim narrative just has to go away, you know, and I've had so much decolonizing to do in my own, in my own context, um, decolonizing and then indigenizing, you know, so learning my language, being back on my home territories, And um, just like I said, I think it really is making space, making space to just breathe and listen. And that's where we're human. And with that, we will wrap up this week's Dose of Dissent. Thank you so much for watching. Please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. Check out the last slide and the show description to see sites mentioned in this week's show. And for continuous updates throughout the week, be sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook. From the West Coast, all power to the people. Good night and act out. And real quick. To keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at Occupy.com slash donate. If you'd like to donate directly to Act Out, visit Patreon.com slash Act Out. I can't hear that boot to stop it! Come on, boys! Let's get some rust to throw! Can't stand to hear my father cry anymore. Time, time we left one of you motherfuckers dead in the road. We've been begging up inch by inch. We got nowhere else to go. It's been too many years since you pushed us off my shelf. I'm not.